Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, and the distinguished panelists. I, Soumya Mathur, on behalf of NCAR and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, extend a very warm welcome to all of you on the occasion of the regional launch of the Asian Infrastructure Finance Report 2022. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank started its operations in 2015 as a multilateral development bank with the primary objective of infrastructure-driven economic development across Asia. Infrastructure for tomorrow is their primary goal. NCAAR, on the other hand, plays a crucial role in, in assessing the possible policy choices for achieving net zero goals for India. The modeling in integration approach adopted by NCAAR helps create scenarios not only on the techno-economic uh, scale, but also on socio-economic range. Add to the title of the report, which is Moonshots for Emerging World, Building State Capacity and Mobilizing the Private Sector Towards Net Zero, it indeed is a colossal task for the emerging world, which suffers from rising debt levels, increasing cost of borrowings, and having limited state capacity to make net zero transition. It requires a quantum leap, both in terms of technology and the economic and institutional setup to achieve the challenge. Building green infrastructure is fundamental to the net zero transition. It offers an opportunity to fill in infrastructure gaps prevailing in the, in, in the emerging economies. State-owned enterprises play a prominent role in most of the emerging markets rather than private sector. So which model for a net zero transition should emerging economies leverage upon? Should it be a state-driven model or a purely market-driven model with private companies and institutional investors? Or how about a model with straddles between the two, like the public-private partnerships. Well, we'll leave this to conclude from today's discussions. I would now like to call upon Dr. Anil Sharma, uh, Secretary NCAR, to address the welcome remarks and introduce the panelists. Dr. Sharma. Thank you, Soumya. I'll join Soumya in welcoming you all to this event, joint event between NCAR and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, she has already in introduced both the institutions, so I will, she has made my job much easier. I'll not really stand between you and the main speaker. Uh, I'll just take a couple of minutes to introduce you to, to Eric Burgoff. Um, he is the first chief economist at the India at the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. He sets the vision and strategy for the economics department and leads the planning, implementation, and supervision of work in support of the bank's mandate. Prior to joining AIIB uh, in September 2020, he was a director of the Institute of Global Affairs, London School of Economics. Uh, and Chief Economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development from 2006 to 2015. He is an expert in transition economies and institutional transformation through private sector development. He holds a PhD in financial economics and an MA in business and economics, both from the Stockholm School of Economics. Just before uh, this event, I was really talking to him so I think you know he has been, of course, visiting NCAR. But when we started discussing it, I just learned that uh, in the uh, first decade of 2000, from 2000 to 2010, when Mr. Sumanberry was the director general of NCAR, he used to visit NCAR as a part of, you know, early setting stage for G20, wherein we had this consortium of four countries: Brazil, China. India and uh, Russia. 
So I think he was a part of those discussions. So it is fortuitous in a way to have him at NCAER and to hold this event jointly with AIIB. I'll now request uh, Eric to take us through the presentation. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for um, uh, doing this together with us, and uh, we're very um, excited uh, about this, and excited about being back in India. Actually, it's the second time this year that I'm here, and uh, India is extremely important to AIIB. It's actually our most important uh, country of operation. Uh, it's actually quite a lot more important than any other country, and uh, it's almost a problem for us that India is so important to us. But um, uh, we, uh, so, so, and of course, thinking about India uh, is something that uh, we um, do a lot of, and, and we'll come back to that in, in the discussion later. But I'm also, as you said, um, uh, very glad to be back at the NCAER. I um, had a, a period where we were pushing something we called the Global Institute, and we started organizing uh, conferences first bilaterally between China and, and Russia, and then between China and, and India, and then trilaterally between China, India, and Russia, and then Brazil came in, and actually South Africa came in as well. And it was a, a very exciting time in the early 2000s, and um, I was very uh, grateful that we could uh, uh, work with um, uh, what was then Suman Barry's uh, uh, team, and, and we had uh, some very interesting uh, discussions that I um, will still uh, uh, remember and influence a lot my, my future work as well. So I'm going to talk about this uh, annual uh, flagship report and uh, give you first a little bit of background to, to why we chose to write this report and then go through the report. So as you will be familiar, in the lead up to COP27 that just took place in Egypt, there was you know, a lot of discussion about loss of damages and, and the compensation that uh, emerging developing countries rightly uh, requested from the advanced economies that had created this problem in climate change. And there was also a lot of, uh, again, legitimate uh, accusations that you, you are asking us to constrain our growth because the problems that you created. And, uh, and, and these are, this was very much uh, the kind of spirit of COP27 and the pleasure to be part of that meeting. And of course, the, probably the most uh, uh, significant con achievement there was that there was at least, it was put on the agenda and it was uh, also uh, in the final conclusion that there was uh, the acknowledgement that there should be establishing a fund to try to uh, achieve these kind of transfers. But, so it was against that background that we conceived of this uh, report because we, we thought the likelihood that these transfers uh, that we think are very legitimate and, and important for them to happen, the likelihood that they will happen will depend a lot on the credibility of the policy framework in the countries that will receive it from. So we wanted to think about how can we create a, a policies that both send the signals and, and the, the level of ambition, but also set sort of a credible set of, of um, uh, institutional arrangements in, in these countries. And of course, they will have to be very different uh, depending on, on, the, on the context of that specific country. And as, as uh, was said earlier, you know, this is the largest uh, or the most a significant challenge to state capacity everywhere, but particularly, of course, in emerging and developing countries where state capacity is, is uh, the most challenged. So, and, and, and uh, so, of course, the background is also that you know, if we have this sort of negative discussion about you know, you know, we, we should have loss and damages and we should, you know, we are being constrained. Uh, they, not a lot of movement has happened in, 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 the, sort of, in the wake of that. Uh, the, the, the emerging world, I mean, the world as a whole is falling behind in, in the race to zero, but the emerging world, the developing world, 
even more so. And that's a reality. And if we then look at what's happening in, in uh, different parts of, of, of these economies in the developing, in the developing world, uh, state owned institutions are excessively exposed in the fuel, fossil fuel sector and they do very little in terms of, of any innovation or, or uh, absorption of uh, green technologies and so on. So that's a bit of context. So it's against that background that we propose uh, this moonshot uh, uh, mission oriented approach. And the moonshot may be a little bit cliche, but probably more so in, in advanced economy. I think in the emerging world and developing world, I don't see that concept used uh, so much. And, and it's there are two essential elements, and, and again, they have been referred to now, but it's about you know, how do we transform the state institutions? And they are so central in many of these economies, and we need to transform them because that's the only way we are going to be uh, enabling and, and, and crowding in the private sector. And of course, we hope then that the, the private sector, what, by working with the private sector, we'll also, in that process, build a, a, a new state capacity. And, and that's sort of the, the, the core of the, this moonshot uh, mission-oriented approach. And, and I got, yes, now I'm going to summarize the, the key elements of, of this approach. So it, the first element is, again, these state-owned institutions that are now laggers, that are so exposed to the fossil fuels, that are in many ways slowing down this process of, of uh, getting to net zero they need to go from laggards to leaders. They need to start um, in divesting from fossil fuels. They need to start uh, investing in renewables. They need to participate in the absorption of, of new uh, technologies. Uh, and, and, well, I'll, I'll come back more, more to that. You'll see uh, later on what, what, more specifically what I mean. The second part is, you know, this, the state cannot do it, this on its own. And we need this, the private sector. We need the private sector because of its capital, but m maybe even more, or, or I would argue even more because of the skills, the experience, the energy that you have in the private sector, the, the dynamism. We're going to need that. But we also need know that to get the things we want out of the private sector, we, the conditions need to be right. And I, I'll come back to what I mean precisely about that. But you can imagine that there are you know, there are a lot of opportunities here for things to go wrong uh, when we engage with the private sector. So we need to make sure that we, we focus on, on creating the right conditions for uh, engaging with the private sector. The third element is about you know, technologies and, and, and green technologies. So the International, agency, International Energy Agency has spoken about, or they looked at all the national determined contributions, all these uh, plants that uh, different countries have uh, made and, and, and declared that here's how we are going to uh, uh, fight climate change uh, under the Paris Agreement. And they looked at all those and what are the kind of technologies that the countries are relying on. And they found 100 technologies new. About 50 of them are in the market but not scalable at the moment. And 50 of them are not even in the market. So we, there's a lot of innovation in the sense of you know, Taking, making these uh, economy, uh, these technologies scalable and bringing uh, those that are not in the market into the market and, and scaling them, and we need to, of course, a lot of that will not happen in in, in, in developing countries, but what needs to happen there, and that's the, what we think should be the focus, is we need to build frameworks that really speeds up that absorption, and we need to make sure that these technologies are truly available for uh, emerging and developing countries. And as you know, there's a lot going on in the world that suggests that there are, not, uh, uh, there are impediments here for, 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 for them being available. And of course, available also with funding, and, and that's uh, going to be essential. The fourth element, uh, which is, I think, generally accepted, but very hard to implement in practice, and, and we don't see enough of a commitment to uh, a carbon price. And the carbon price, why is the carbon price so important? Well, it is, of course, important because it affects consumption you know, in, in households and, and in, in, in manufacturing. But it's also very important because it 
really provides incentives for innovation. So it's a, a, a combination of, of, of the impact that it has across uh, the economy and sending signals throughout. Extremely important. But it won't be sufficient. So we need also uh, a lot of uh, what I call mission-driven uh, coordination. And, and, and that's, of course, where the state capacity is going to be you know, uh, very critical, because this is, this is uh, things that require strong institutions to, to get it right. So, uh, and the final thing, and this is something that, of course, is very much on the minds of, of policymakers in, in, in India, is to make sure that this transition, as it happens, is, is smooth, so people can predict and, and make choices in their lives, and it's fair, so we, it's an inclusive process, so people that are affected by the, the decommissioning of fossil fuel assets, you know, they are uh, reskilled and or compensated, and, 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 that, and that's not just an add-on, this is absolutely critical. Uh, you say, I, I was presented as an expert on transition. And I, you know, one thing I know about transition is that if you don't include this social element and you, the, this transition process is going to be reversed or be uh, deviated. And, and you, it's so critical to br bring this and integrate this as, as a, a key element of the, the process. It, and so it, it is. It's mentioned here last, but it's absolutely central to, to, to the motion. So I thought to, so this is the, the six elements that we I identified as the most important one. I, I thought I would give you one example uh, as an illustration. Uh, it's not a sort of complete one, but it's someone, one that I think uh, kind of gives you a, a, a sort of more concrete idea of, of what we're talking about. So this is something called the Nuefi, uh, means something like welcoming in, in, in Arabic. It's um, a um, so-called platform um, or country platform that was announced at the COP27 by Egypt. So it's Egypt's attempt to, to do a moonshot in a way. So it's, it, it looks at the, you know, how can we build uh, re the renewable sector in uh, Egypt has tremendous uh, opportunities in the, particularly in solar, but also in wind actually. And um, what it does, it brings together uh, a, a long pipeline of renewable projects, solar and wind in particular, but also some other. But but and then it also provides a program for phasing out fossil fuel assets, and and with that also some uh, just transition programs. It brings together the development partners of, of India, particularly uh, the uh, development banks. So EBRD has been particularly uh, engaged in this, but also AIB is part of this. Uh, European Investment Bank is part of this. But then, and the here I think are the sort of interesting elements uh, of this, uh, which I think by creating this platform, uh, it has been, uh, they have been able to raise concessional finance from the US to, to <coughs> finance these uh, transition uh, compensation to, to workers in the fuel, fossil fuel industry and, and training programs and, and so on. And from Germany they have got uh, what you call climate performance linked uh, uh, debt finance. So it's a new innovative way of, of, of providing debt so you, you tie it to achievements uh, on, on the climate uh, agenda and, and that gives you cheaper uh, debt finance. And finally, and this I think is maybe the most important uh, reason for doing this, we know that very few of these renewable products or, or inputs are produced in uh, emerging and developing countries. China is of course an exception. But um, we need to find much more of that production locally. And here, by putting these renewable products on this platform, creating visibility, now for the first time, uh, Egypt uh, gets uh, investment, so it's a blade uh, for wind power, a blade producer uh, from Germany is locating production to Egypt because they see this, can, this pipeline will make it uh, worthwhile for us. To. So I, I don't want to be provocative, but I think actually this is something that India could think about. You know, India has spoken about wanting to have compensation for 
the damage that uh, other countries have, have caused uh, and, and the, the damage that India you know, is experiencing from, from uh, climate change. Getting one of these uh, arrangements, I think, could be uh, an idea. So I'll put it out there for you to shoot down. But I think it's, 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 it's one way of thinking about how these kind of compensation could happen. So I think you have the, the basic story now. So I will now go through the different elements and, and, and try to give you a sense of, of uh, uh, where, where we come from. So you remember the title, so the subtitle was uh, Building State Capacity and Mobilizing Private Sector. And I think it's important to think about it in that order because you need to build that state state capacity in order to mobilize the private sector. And so we need to think about how do we build state capacity and what is the foundation of, of state capacity. And the foundation of state capacity is ultimately uh, trust in government. And how do we build trust in government? How do we build a sense of common interest? And, and, and that is, uh, I think, what has been the sort of holy grail of, of development uh, for a long for a long time. And, and this suggests also that you know, when we talk about these kind of trade-offs between sustainable development and, and climate, it might not be so much of a trade-off. Actually, the things we need to do to achieve the net zero transition is arguably the same things we need to do to achieve uh, sustainable development. And I'll, I'll make that argument as we, as we go along, because I think the, the and, and in a way, climate gives us an additional reason and, and a stronger motivation for doing those reforms that we have been talking about for so long, you know, reforming state-owned enterprise and reforming the state-owned financial institutions, uh, building state capacity. That is uh, at the core. And this common interest that net zero provides, this sense of we have to go in this direction. You know, we spoke a little bit before here about, you know, the India between the state and, and, and the local level, or the, the, the national level and the state level, the federal level and the state level, and creating a sense of, of common interest. And everyone realizes at some level that we are all affected by climate and we have to work together to do this. I think this works. Uh, it's an un I think something that is an unusually powerful thing to bring uh, people together. So I, I'm saying this as, as a sort of hopeful thing or maybe this could be uh, the foundation of, of getting movement on some of these sustainable development uh, agenda items and, and, and making progress on, on the state building state capacity that we have tried for, for so long. So, 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 we, so, so the first thing is to say, you know, when we think about state capacity, what are the kind of institutions that the state can influence? And state-owned enterprises, is of course one of those, and, and we know that the influence may not always be so effective as we want, but but it's there. And, and state-owned institutions, uh, state-owned enterprises, are important. They are, they they raise uh, very considerable funds, and we we, we document this uh, in uh, in the report, and we have done a, a lot of work to to, to go through uh, the role of, of um, uh, different. Uh, Investor and different uh, institutions in, in, in raising uh, capital for, uh, particularly in the, in, the, in the green space, and, and state-owned uh, enterprises are, are very important. They are also important because they can actually raise capital more cheaply. We may think that's good or, or bad, but it's a reality. And actually, that difference between the state and the private in terms of costs of, of raising capital is is, is greater in uh, emerging and developing countries. So. Whether we like it or not, we think that this advantage should be used to um, push uh, the net zero uh, transition. And similarly, when we think about the state-owned uh, financial institutions, we should think about their development capacity. And of course, here you have the commercial banks, the state-owned commercial banks, but you also have the national development banks, very important in, in many countries. You have the sovereign wealth funds that some, in some countries uh, are very passive, but there, there is the potential of using them also for uh, uh, developmental purposes. And we know also that the central banks, actually in many advanced economies and now also in some developing economies, are becoming 
you know, more and more engaged in, in the climate um, uh, agenda and, and, and looking, going through uh, identifying climate risks in, in the financial system and so on. And central banks are, you know, in many developing and, and particularly in fragile uh, uh, countries, kind of bastions or islands of, of state capacity that potentially could be places we can start implementing some of the things we are talking about here. The, and, and these state-owned financial institutions are interesting because they can often be part of sort of more long-term investments and uh, uh, l larger projects. They can help to partner with uh, the private sector. So we think that this is an, an, another tool that maybe is underestimated uh, when it comes to uh, implementing the net zero transition. But what, when we look at what they actually do today, so here's first looking at their threes, they are comparing here the state-owned enterprises and private sector investment. They are much more exposed in uh, oil and gas uh, SOEs than our private sector. And, and similarly, when you look at state-owned banks, here comparing state-owned banks, uh, transactions with a state-owned bank uh, and those without any state-owned bank. And again, you can see that oil and gas is, is uh, much more important in the, in the uh, when there's a state-owned bank uh, present. So I'm just saying this to you. So, so, so going from leader, or from laggards to leaders is, of course, that we need to get these fossil fuels uh, 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 dependent SOEs and, uh, and state-owned financial institutions to start engaging in renewables. And you know, we have this, and uh, unfortunately, India is a little bit of an example of this, you know, where you have so much strong presence, you know, with some exceptions, of, of mostly state-owned in the fossil fuels and renewables, mainly private. And, you know, there are some, I know that Coal India now is doing renewables, and there are some private investments in, 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 in the fossil fuel sector. But that is a completely artificial uh, distinction. It shouldn't have to be like that, and it's probably not a good thing if you want to push the net zero agenda. So we need to get, give incentives to these SOEs and, and state-owned financial institutions to, to engage on renewables. We need to put pressure on them to green value chains, both in the manufacturing and, and, and service sectors, but also, very importantly, in the, in, in the financial uh, uh, value chains. We need to engage them on mobilizing private capital. We need to uh, have them uh, go through governance reform, that I spoke about, it is something we have been arguing you know, for a long time, uh, and we, you know, some countries have been more successful than others, but here we have another good reason for why we need to push this agenda. And we think also these can become central coordination uh, institutions when it comes to, to uh, bringing together all the actors that are needed to implement the, the net zero transition. Um, I wasn't going to say so much about this slide, just to say that uh, you know, private participation in, uh, has increased in, 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 in green infrastructure, but it does require a, a lot more. And, and uh, you know, it's there, and it, you know, it differs a lot uh, across different uh, countries. Here is the PPP investment in electricity generation in Asia, just to give you one example. And, and it differs uh, quite a bit across different uh, aspects of infrastructure. But on the whole, we need to make a big push uh, to get the private. Thing. But again, we need, we need to, to do that, we need to create the right uh, conditions. And I, I stressed that earlier on, and I want to come back to that now, because it's about regulation, it's about uh, competition policy, it's about uh, the capacity to, to organize contracts. So, this uh, one graph is probably uh, my favorite graph in the, in the whole report. It's very simple. It just says that you know, if you have a regulation that says that uh, the electrici electricity tariff is set by the most efficient supplier, renewables wins out. And, and you know, it's a very simple rule, and, and it's a simple regulation, if enforced, will on its own push the renewables uh, uh, agenda and will put, help us uh, move towards net zero. Um, competitive bidding we show in, uh, in, in, uh, in the report 
really helps um, adding renewable capacity. And, and we know that this renewable sector is quite complex when it comes to contracting, often delays, a lot of renegotiation. Policy context around these are, are very um, tr tricky often, and, and so it's very important that you have robust contract uh, management and so on. So state capacity becomes important, and of course, there's been an incredible evolution or revolution, if you want, of, of, um, of the pricing and, and, and or, or the costs of renewables. So now the world is flooded with cheap renewables, but it's not so obvious that we have the capacity to manage this everywhere and, and the, the demands that it pushes on, uh, pu puts on, on the rest of the energy system. Uh, so we, we have to really uh, try to build state capacity to to make use of all the potential that comes from renewable. So, so um, I spoke initially about the need for innovation and all these new technologies. And, and we, so we looked a lot at patenting data. Of course, patenting data focuses on things that are genuinely new. Not, not, it doesn't only have that, but uh, things that are genuinely new at the, at the global level. And of course, what we really care about is what is helping in a particular economy move towards net zero. So it's, it's, it's about, this is a, a patenting data showing um, across different countries uh, uh, the value, so these are looking at patents and, and then uh, estimating the value of those patents and comparing uh, different parts of the world. And we can see that actually, you know, India is, is nowhere on, on this, which is surprising given the sophistication of, of, of uh, of India when it comes to, to a lot of, of science and, and so on. So, the, um, so here is, a, you know, the focus here should be uh, on developing uh, not so much the, the uh, things that are n new globally, but uh, it, the focus should be very much on making sure that these technologies that are developed, wherever they're developed, they're available and, and the, the countries can absorb them and, and develop uh, innovation uh, platforms that uh, focus on, on uh, absorption and, and, and adaptation of technologies. And, and um, that requires, I think, a lot of sort of um, a, a mix of policies and carbon pricing, as I emphasized early on, is going to be a very important element of that. But you cannot do it on its own. You need to think about how do you push this um, innovation agenda. How, um, can you combine it with uh, access to finance and, 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 and technology, and how can uh, we find various ways of, of facilitating this? I'm going to say now a few final uh, words here on, on state capacity, because I, th I think we've I've spoken in very general terms about state capacity, and I, of course won't, won't be time to go in too much depth, but I, I wanted to bring out a few features that I think are important of state capacity. and so. So there are three words that we sort of picked up from, from, from the literature, this sort of credibility, so the ability to stick to policies. And, 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 and here, um, maybe the most important one is to really enact uh, emission, uh, emission pricing and, and reduce fossil fuel subsidies, and, and being able to stick to that and giving clear signals to, to you know, the state-owned sector, but also to the private sector, and, and that's going to be a, a critical element of, of credibility. Before we said the coordination will be needed, uh, having a dedicated body to inform and monitor implementation. And, and here we're thinking about you know, some of these um, climate councils or, or climate committees or, or, or uh, uh, you know, that have a, a, a role in, in terms of keeping alive the discussion and the debate around climate, uh, pushing um, uh, you know, different mi ministries, different entities at different levels of government uh, to, to uh, push uh, uh, net zero agenda forward, working with uh, academics to, to bring in research and, and so on, keeping that alive, having a dedicated body that also is independent from, from government, importantly. Uh, that, I think, is, is, is um, a key element in the coordination. Finally, on expertise, having a dedicated institution that really uh, knows how to assess uh, these uh, different uh, green technologies and how to adopt them, what is best suited for, for our uh, energy system. Um, 
I'm conscious of time now. And, 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 yeah, and, uh, I think you know we started ten minutes late. Yeah. So if you can wrap up in two three minutes. Yeah. So so so. Have so to take yeah. Questions from the audience. Yeah. Exactly. So so. Um, we have we, we in the report we we go through three country studies. One is of India, uh, one is of Indonesia, and one is of China. And I think I don't need to tell you what what India uh, is about, but I I'll just say that you know for us. The, um, I think the, the, the real challenge, I think, in, in India is how you know, the private sector has done an incredible job in, in pushing uh, renewables, but we need to, to, there need to be uh, the same uh, uh, thing happening in the state-owned sector, and there are some positive signs in terms of uh, coal India, for example, moving into renewables and so on, but we need to have, uh, uh, you know, all, all hands on deck when it comes to renewables. The, the electric mobility sector, uh, the EV electric vehicles need to uh, develop. The, uh, when it comes to green finance, it's still, I think, very much in nation state. There's a lot of room for development there. Again, uh, I think you, 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 you know uh, this. It's, but it's a bit surprising that, for example, private banks have not been more engaged uh, when it comes to, to financing renewables. Uh, and relatively little FDI inflows uh, into the non-conventional energy sector. So these are some things that we think uh, could be worth pushing uh, deeper in understanding. Uh, i probably skip Indonesia. Uh, just a few words on, on China, because I think there are some elements of the Chinese experience that is uh, interesting. Uh, is the, 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 um, so we look on some reforms that China has gone through. And, and try to learn what do, do we learn from, from those. So when you look at SOE reform in, in, in China, we know that this privatization uh, that China went through actually helped make SOEs uh, more efficient, but they had no impact when it came to their environmental performance. But when China introduced uh, into these evaluation of SOE managers, as you know, they have very elaborate evaluation systems of SOE managers and, and these managers often circulate you know, from uh, enterprises to banks and sometimes in, in the government is a very uh, uh, elaborate um, promotion system. When they introduced environmental uh, elements into that uh, system, we can show in, in, in the data that there's a very clear change in, uh, in, in the behavior of state-owned enterprises. And I think this is something that could be replicated in, in, in in some way, perhaps in, in in other countries too. Again, it's not you can probably not uh, replicate it uh, one one on one, but but it it it, it is um, an interesting idea. Um, obviously, uh, China is now launching it has, has launched its emissions trading system. There's quite a lot more to do with that, and and, and you know it's now it's very big, but it's still the price is not uh, high enough, and and there is still a need to expand it to cover more of the Chinese. Uh, Economy. So I think I'll, I'll, summer, I'll stop here. I, I, it's about you know, applying in this mission-driven policy framework, uh, start by building state capacity and reform the SOEs and, and, and so, uh, state-owned financial institutions to help lead the transition, mobilize the private sector skills and capital, and use that to, to also build state capacity, you know, build, uh, engage in, in public-private partnerships. I haven't spoken so much of that. We have a chapter on that. but use PPPs and, and, and then build PPP units that then allows um, to sp that uh, knowledge to spread across sectors, um, uh, develop technology adoption frameworks adjusted to local conditions, and, and you know, make sure that these um, uh, technologies for, for green um, development are, are available and, and um, of course, uh, make sure that this transition is smooth and fair. And of course, as an MDB, so maybe finish with that, is that you know, we, we think that you know, there is a message for us here too. We need to think more broadly, for example, in India, across all the investments that we are making in India, we need to become more uh, integrated in, in and make sure that they are of course, integrated in what India wants to do, but also integrated in terms of uh, consistent uh, uh, 
uh, across in investments, and we probably need to be more participating in building the environment around these investments uh, as, as well. So with those words, thank you very much, and, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, there's a lot of information and analysis in the report, and I think you know they have uh, you done a thorough review of literature and have really put various actions in uh, action points in buckets. So I'm sure the audience has some questions. Let us take one or two questions. I think you know before the panel discussion. Yes. That was a very interesting presentation. It'll, um, it'll be you, nice if you can also introduce it. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm Neeta Mehra from JNU. Okay. I, I sort of work on climate impacts adaptation. Mm -hmm. So that's where you know this question comes from. Uh, so most of the work that you presented, mm -hmm. uh, when you talk of net zero, the focus is essentially on climate mitigation, mm -hmm. as I understand. Now, if you were to go broader, uh, given the fact that climate change has happened mm. and there are local communities that are mm. really suffering uh, in terms of capturing vulnerability, whether that's due to slowly changing climate mm. or extreme mm. climate events, mm. uh, uh, is AIIB uh, also thinking of uh, you know, investments in adaptation infrastructure, which could be in the form of early warning systems or mm. climate weather advisories mm. through ICTs? Uh, that was the question. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, um, so a couple of answers to that. The first one is how does it fit into this analysis that I, I agree that we focus uh, here uh, a lot on mitigation, but I actually think that the, the sort of just transition ha also has elements of you know, building resilience and making sure that as we go through this transition, we also see to it that we are making sure that the impacts of climate is, is shared, you know, and that we try to soften uh, the impact for, for those most vulnerable. So actually this is very important for AIB and, and we, I think, I think we have the highest share of adaptation finance of, of, uh, of any MDB and I think we are up somewhere around 35% now uh, in, in terms of, of our share. We look at every investment to, that we make to, to scre screen it for whether we can, is there some possibility? It is very difficult, as you, as you know, having worked on, on adaptation finance, it's much more difficult to, to structure uh, uh, projects around uh, and, and, and finance projects uh, around adaptation because it's, it's more difficult to find revenue streams that you can contract on. And, and that is why there's this kind of bias in the system against adaptation. And we need to find ways of of, of, of um, dealing with that, and, and uh, I, I don't have a you know, ready-made solution for that, but I, I think we need to, to, we need to uh, make sure that enough resources f flows into that space, and, and uh, AIB really is very committed to, to that. I think maybe one more question before we go for the panel discussion. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Then thank you very, very much. I think I'll uh, in request Burnali to invite the panelists yeah. and start the next uh, mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank, thank, thank you. <laughs>
where in 2022, December, we are still saying moonshots for the emerging world, does show that how much uh, ground we have to cover. That is, I think, a very major uh, point. And um, as Dr. Eric Berghoff's uh, presentation showed, frankly, the ground to be covered is far more than <clears throat> what has been covered. So building state capacity and mobilizing the private sector towards net zero. Uh, what I'll do is, um, Bonali had uh, suggested that I give a first initial few minutes for speaking on it. I will rather forego that opportunity. What I'll instead do is this is a very good panel. Dr. Bhandari, Mr. Rahul Bharti, Dr. Das Gupta, they are all extremely erudite and most important, they like to share what they have, uh, the, the, the knowledge, the extremely engaging speakers. So instead of me trying to give it, get into issues, let me ask and I'll start, uh, Lavish, I'll start with you. Um, you know, the very provocatively handled word moonshots, uh, that from there, let me start off from there itself. Uh, take a few minutes, um, say everybody, we are saying five minutes, but like four to five minutes is probably a better idea. And anything they have to say, I mean, we all say, we always say things which we say first, and then after that, that, is, that itself is the most important point. Uh, so, 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 Lavish, then I'll come to Pratas Gupta and then Raul on that uh, sequence. So, yeah, what, what are your initial ideas? Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks to NCAER, AIIB, Anil Bernali for inviting me here. I must say that was an excellent presentation, and I really loved uh, what I read. And I must say that after s seeing your presentation, I'm going to go back and read it even more carefully. Um, uh, any report does, uh, I think, has two objectives. One is, of course, to improve awareness. Uh, and the second is to instigate thought. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about the four or five points uh, which have been highlighted and what thoughts I had on those. And, and, that, and later we can, of course, go into a specific issue. Uh, first, I really loved the point when you started off that there is an inherent unfairness. And while we can all accept it and also complain about it, we have to move on from that. Uh, and I cannot underscore the unfairness in net zero, unfairness in choosing a date, and not looking at the transition path, unfairness in calling for carbon taxation and carbon pricing without truly really understanding the massive ramifications it just could have. Uh, but we all need to handle this problem. And uh, one way of handling this problem has already been addressed in the Q&A. Uh, in all probability, we are not going to make it we're probably not going to make the two degree as well. 1.5 is gone. So the challenge before us, while mitigation is kind of a necessary thing for survival, it is not sufficient, it is adaptation. We will not survive, and what I mean by survival is essentially strong economies that are able to generate surpluses, which can mitigate all the way down to 2070 or 2050. So we need to adapt quickly. And adaptation is not just about uh, people and livelihoods. Adaptation is also about governance. Adaptation is also, of course, about industry. And adaptation is also, of course, about the relationships, the institutions, that all will need to adapt to a very different environment. Um, the report, I think, does a very good job. It's not just talking about a general objective. No go down to specifics. Fine, if you need to change, then you do need to change your public sector entities. Absolutely, and in India especially, we do need to change our, uh, the way uh, PACs uh, work, have worked in the past. But you know, that's a challenge for us researchers. Uh, PACs have always been a challenge. My first study that I did when I came back to India was actually in NCAER, was on public sector reform. And it hasn't changed. It was like, what, 25 years back? It hasn't changed. I did six different versions of the book. The book never got published, but everyone in the government read it. OK, but it, nothing has changed. Now, just saying that, OK, fine, because of climate, now you need to change the way you govern public sector enterprises. Yeah, I would love to, for that to happen, but you know, it's really not going to happen. But again, 
that is for us researchers to identify, you know, what is the way, what is the political economic challenge that we need to grapple. We, we need to just get out of this our orientation with economics. Uh, so that's one part. And since I have only two minutes left, I'm going to go to the next part of what I, I think we need to uh, really think a lot about. In the end, this battle will be won by technology. We all know it. And economics and policy will just aid it. Right? It is technology. The problem is that the bulk, if you study the patents, the bulk of the patents that across the developing world, Asian world, etc., we are getting, are in areas which are, which are end of the line. Our challenge is finding that right molecule for that battery. It's in the basic science. Basic science research, perhaps to a lesser extent China, but generally perhaps to a lesser extent uh, Japan. But basic science research and innovation is right now not happening in the bulk of Asia. It is in the developed countries domain. So in fact, if I wanted to spend as an Indian for any basic scientific research, I should give money to the United States. That's the only way to save myself. Does not make sense for you to invest in science in India at this point in time and get, because it has a 30 year uh, or a 20 year this, right, horizon. You can't do that. So you better invest in the United States if you want to have the right kind of science. So I'd like us as researchers to actually think of these issues. I'm not saying this is the answer. What I'm saying is these are the questions that as researchers we need to be having. And I think this report does a great job of throwing some of these challenges. Wonderful. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Lavish. And I think uh, you really, really, really made it as provocative as I just expected it to. Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, it is, and, and that's the advantage of uh, speaking with Lavish. You always come back with some very good ideas. Uh, I won't paraphrase what you're saying. I'll just instead turn to Dr. Das Gupta and ask you that as an economist, um, Dr. Bhagov was talking about climate finance. And um, I remember in, uh, just after the Second World War, the World Bank came up with this concept of IDA, concessional finance, 150 years, at practically no, no, no money. Uh, is it possible for multilateral institutions, we have quite a few of them now, to pull together, they keep on telling us countries to pull together, for them to pull together to create a concessional finance at that possible rates? And uh, I mean, that's one of the issues that I thought I'll just put on your table. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. So now I'm debating whether to up the debate level or throw in some more ideas. <laughs> I thought there's already enough on the plate, but you oh, just... I, I, I thought the, you were just really pushing the, the, You just added to it, but um, so I'm suitably provoked. And um, I'm going to say, I don't know about the multilateral thing, but I would say that one of the issues that really um, I think is important to, to link with this is the issue of what does a post-2030 world look like. I mean, we are all so focused on 2070, but I don't see how net zero 2070 can get conceptualized or operationalized for an economy like India or any other emerging or developing country uh, without also some parallel thinking on what does a post-2030 SDG world look like? Somehow, most, most of the thinking that I see seems to just simply assume away that part of the story and decide somehow we will reach all the 2030 agenda goals on, on terms of poverty, inequality. It's all sort of assumed that some, and you know, it's, okay to assume some basic sufficientarianism principle and say, okay, so this is some basic level of living you've reached and that's fine and every economy will be able to take care of it. So if that is the case, then a just transition is a transition where you would allow policy instruments to be framed in keeping with national circumstances, right? So it wouldn't be only about what would be a global goal, but a global goal in sync with national circumstances. I think this is another part that is not really thought through when we think about net zero alone. 
So, you know, I mean, this is something that to focus on, and multilateralism has to support both the parallel processes. Multilateralism, when you say climate finance, it isn't sufficient to only have multilateralism through operating in the sphere of climate finance. It has to be financed more holistically, within which it has to be climate finance. I mean, even if you see the IPCC reports, let's take climate finance, for instance. So that's categorically establishing that, yes, global uh, flows are insufficient, but even current availability of finance is such that if you managed it better, you could up it by three to five times. So I don't think there's much of anything left to debate about the need for multilateralism or, uh, you know, uh, managing our climate finance flows better. I don't think that is debatable for me. What is debatable for me is what happens, what does the world look like after 2030 in terms of all these multiple national priorities that many countries have. And we are just, we have nothing on the table as yet on that. So have we just assumed all that away or have we, do we all feel very confident we're going to be there? Many of these trade-offs will disappear. And um, the second point I'd like to make is on cost of transition. And I really, really like the AIB report on that. I like the way you frame transitions and the great job you do in terms of focusing on state capacities, because this is the other point, and here I will uh, take up Lavish on that. Let me say, I think most of the financing focus so far is on technology. In fact, the whole mitigation debate is around technology and uh, financing of hard infrastructure, whereas there's much less on the soft costs and finances for the stuff, soft costs. So it's really great that the AIB report has focused on the soft costs of transition, which includes state capacities. Thank you. Well, that's quite something. PSA, uh, Lavish, you talked about the PSC reforms, and I was just wondering whether there should be a multilateral reforms also. <laughs> uh, they are, they, I haven't seen them changing in the last 25 years. So, uh, Rahul, <clears throat> the ball is yours. There's one point which uh, Dr. Bhargav mentioned, that in India, the renewable transition is being largely private sector uh, driven. Uh, is that something to be concerned about in the sense that I say that a private sector doesn't come in unless there's a price is right. So have we, that means getting, are we getting that therefore the price is fair, right? Carbon pricing and all those things. Uh, among other points, I, I was wondering whether you'd like to look at that. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me to this excellent forum and I, I, I wish more such uh, uh, fora happen. At least we'll learn more. Uh, on your specific question on uh, not just renewable, it, about other uh, vehicles of achieving or not achieving, uh, moving towards carbon net zero, I think uh, the private sector is the ideal vehicle. The private sector is the ideal vehicle because it's the most efficient solution for, for achieving almost anything. Uh, they have a clear goal, goal post. They, they deploy technology. And uh, to that extent, I'll, I kind of agree with you. Fortunately, India, for example, FDI is open in most sectors. So it is available to, it is possible to avail of global technology at variable cost or acquire or bring in those entrepreneurs into India. We are ourselves a case of uh, a foreign investment. Uh, I have put up India's first lithium-ion cell plant in Gujarat, the only plant which manufactures lithium ions at the cell level. Uh, then we go to batteries. Uh, most of them are uh, assembling batteries from imported cells. And not, are, not only are we importing, uh, not only are we localizing cells, we are exporting them also. In addition to this, Another technology, since you said, and it's even for us, it's very difficult to second guess technology. And lithium ion is not the end of the world. The last word on battery technology is yet to be written. There's a lot of research going on, on uh, uh, solid state, on metal air, etc. better solutions for, for storage. Uh, 
uh, because renewable, one more, one very important component, of, I mean, uh, partner of renewable is storage. Without storage, renewable doesn't, uh, doesn't fly. So I believe uh, the job of, of uh, you know, bridging the viability stretch belongs to the private sector with all their innovation, with all their hard work, and competition is a beautiful uh, enabler. Uh, it pushes you to achieve more, to stretch more, and, and achieve it. The only missing link, what we see is, uh, and you said, ec uh, you talked about two things, economics and policy. I agree with one and differ with the other. <laughs> Economics is purely integrated into it. So I, for example, as a private sector player, cannot separate energy, environment, and it's economics okay. from each other. It's impossible. And trust me, uh, we eat, sleep, drink uh, yeah. environment all the time. So all that's our product point. We do eat and drink environment all the time. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a very good quote. OK. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, With all respect to humor, uh, I seriously meant it. Because all our product plans, they start with energy efficiency. Uh, our starting point, our central, it is not a very important pillar. It is the starting point and the central pillar of all our strategy making. So uh, uh, we, we, but so economics is clearly linked in. Policy, as you said, is, is only a side, uh, side issue. However, policy can sometimes be quite, if sufficient capacity doesn't exist with policy makers, it can be quite of a, you know, a wild card. The biggest sec uh, challenge that private sector faces is to keep second guessing policy. The major issue with policy is, with whatever understanding of energy or environment, uh, yeah, I'll finish, but it's an important point. Sometimes they end up incentivizing the means rather than the end to the means. It is easier for us to you know, judge how will technology change over the next 10 years, how will product obsolescence be, what will be the new technology on the higher horizon. We can take a risk on technology. We can take a risk on uh, uh, consumer trends. But taking a risk on second-guessing policy is very difficult for us. I'll come to that point. That's an important point. But uh, before that, I'll let me go back to Dr. Dasgupta. Dr. Dasgupta, you're saying about the fact that uh, more than technology, it is the adaptation, which is so significant. Um, the cabinet this year, if I remember, they were saying that the, we'll reduce the overall emission intensity and improve energy efficiency of the economy over time, and at the same time protecting the vulnerable sections of economy and segments of our society. Uh, how do you think this playing out in, 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 in what uh, Rahul was talking about in terms of policy? Um, well, uh, I think that's, that's got a lot of ways to answer that. Um, so my understanding is that you know, we have to do both. It's not a question of a choice anymore. So given that, I think, uh, no, it's, it's going to be tentative, I guess. On the mitigation front, it's obviously, there's a lot of space for seeing what, what help we can get through multilateral processes, even bilateral arrangements. So for example, you know, Suppose it's something like carbon, CCUS, carbon capture utilization storage uh, technology, for instance. Now, we know that billions of dollars have been spent in the US itself. And it is still not commercially viable, right? So yesterday, day before, in fact, I was at the Ministry of Science and Technology, and we were reviewing proposals on trying to, on this issue. and. Uh, you see, one of the ideas that kept coming to my mind was this, that are we just expected to re repeat, as Lavish was also pointing out, the, the experience, are we going to be again, whether it's private, whether it's public, whether it's, uh, it's some kind of a collaboration, again going to be spending that, that much money, living, going through those same experiences to get to the point where we 
where we you know sort of find out how these work and how to adopt these in the Indian conditions. You can't just pick them up from here and put them here. Soil strata is different, geomorphology is different, there are a lot of things there. The basics of how the chemistry works will be very different here. So at one level, I think we have very good reasons to expect that our mitigation strategies should be enabled by, with international collaboration. There's no getting away from it, right? It's not only about finance. On the adaptation front, um, it's, it's like this. You know, I see that the very fact of the transition means that adaptation costs are going to be part of it. It's here to stay, right? What you've already put out there in the atmosphere is going to stay. And we're going to have to adapt to it is one idea. The other idea is that this is part of your transition costs. Because every time you have a setback, suppose for instance you have a drought, you have an agri uh, agricultural price shock, which in turn leads to some kind of an inflation, maybe you need monetary policy to step in. How are you going to get away from the economics of it? So your, right? So, so your, I think the, the things are going to go together in the economy, both the adaptation and the mitigation. You're not going to get away from one to the other. And as you, so this you can frame as an independent kind of channel of causation. But there are going to be things like, suppose today you, I hear this talk about you know carbon price, implicit or explicit. Yeah. Suppose it's a carbon tax, yeah. for I, instance. I, I, can I just can I just stop you here in a minute? The reason I'm saying it is because uh, I'm also yeah, sure. looking at my watch sure. continuously. Um, but you put up a very interesting thing, and that I think relates to what you're saying. It relates to building state capacity, uh, whether when you bring in issues like monetary policy and everything else, adapting Indian position. Lavisha, you 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 put a very you started on a very as I say very attacking note. Footballing, uh, unfairness of it all. So, building state capacity. I mean, do you think uh, that is? I mean, how well do you, does it address that unfairness challenge? So, Your uh, mic is. You take that. Are you going to use? Yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. Um, actually, state capacity is always being built. Uh, it's consistently being built in some form or the other. Uh, but the way as what, what we have been doing, and I'm being a bit introspective here, as an economist, what we've been taking is a model which is a liberal economics model, and we are saying, hey, your capacities need to be in sync with our model. Okay? We are act we've actually been wrong in this. Uh, so in that, sense, uh, in that sense, what we really need is a state capacity which is in line with whatever is the requirement of that time. It is not clear to me that public-private partnerships, for instance, are necessarily the only way out. I mean, a classic example, and uh, public-private partnerships can be defined in so many different ways. I mean, it can just include just about everything. For instance, a renewable energy uh, space, is it a public-private partnership? Is it a private only, this thing, the amount of guarantees that the state has given, uh, especially in terms of, you know, getting revenues on time? Is that a sort of a public-private partnership? Is it private sector only? I'm not sure. But generally, the way it is considered is that the state and the private sector are, have co-ownership of some type. Right? Now, if you, if you remove that definition, then I don't think public-private partnership uh, uh, is a problem. If you insist that state and private sector have to, in a sense, be co-owners, then I have a serious problem with PPPs. So that's, having said that, uh, Public-private partnerships in a larger sense, again, of course will be critical. No one's going to invest in your renewable energy given the way our DISCOMs function. It's just not going to work, right? So yes, it is critical. Um, uh, it is really critical unless you promise that, uh, that if you invest today, you're not going to three years or four years down the line, I'm talking about renewable energy here, charge the prices that are applicable at that time need to make those promises no one else is going to invest so in that sense the state has to play some sort of a role right um, but but there is a very serious problem and I go back to it the state will be in deep trouble and I think Pranamita has already attested to it there are going to be there can be huge macro implications of what's going to happen uh, the state may not be able to handle the kind of pressures that could come up if we have even frequent weather, uh, extreme weather events, 
even that could you know stretch and i'm not just talking about india i'm talking about uh, the whole uh, developing world so i think there is an issue here i th i go back to the point that i'm making adapt if you cannot handle the challenge you will not be able to mitigate so i would the way i i i think of this say let us focus on adaptation and of course mitigation is a perhaps a sideline event on that um, i'll i'll want to ask something india is i mean it's it's built up a sizable state capacity and this i'll come to Das Gupta also and i'll ask Rahul also later but you first but the state capacity in india and this also has to include state governments if they have to take on the entire laundry list of being a good regulator for emerging technologies for ensuring that the prices charged are correct and fair and also do adaptation because that will not be coming from the private sector that will be a state led thing is there space for doing all of that to put it what Kundamita is saying that by expecting that all of that will be getting done by 2030 I mean that's a huge laundry list to put on the state a country like India even but, though it's, a, it's got a big bureaucracy and I'm, I'm quite you know that's that. the beauty of the price mechanism it can create those things except when there's a qualifier and again I keep on going back because we ourselves don't know the ramifications suppose we were to put in a very uh, uh, how do I say uh, a very effective carbon price mechanism suppose right the amount of change that it there will be in the economy uh, it could have very serious implications right especially because we, we, are, we think that to be able to make a difference we need we only have let's say let's about 10 years or 15 years beyond that then things get out of hand right uh, so if we very quickly put up an effective carbon pricing mechanism we get into macroeconomic trouble if we don't then there is a mitigation problem so in that sense i do i do again go back adapt that is the critical focus. And of course, through the public sector, whatever we can do on the mitigation front, there are only a few organizations that need to be addressed. You can. Like you, you, you said the cat on the pigeons <laughs> by saying this adaptation thing. So like, do you think that the state has the capacity to do all of that? Uh, because uh, all the while ramping up capacity with the private sector. I think the state has to be enabled to play a certain leadership role. I, uh, there are international experts here, but my limited understanding is that we do not have examples from anywhere in the world, including the global north, where it is the private sector. Of course, there are individuals who may have done it or taken leadership where the state has not been required to step in in a big way to initiate tran the transitions in either at a sectoral level at any stage in the economy without the state stepping in and taking the leadership. It hasn't happened. It has happened in collaborations. It has happened in certain cases with the state stepping up and taking the leadership and maybe it's come in through a regulatory manner, through a command and control approach. And where markets have functioned, Markets have functioned because often enough, these did not just pop up out of the blue like that. It happened because there was a lot of regulatory focus on the need for a certain outcome. So I do see that particularly in an emerging economy context where you have so many trade-offs happening simultaneously and so much demand on your resources. I don't think there is any way you're going to see this happening without state capacities being built up to at least take leadership on it. Without it, you can't do it. It's, it's my take. Okay, um, talking of state capacity, three years ago, Transport Minister Mr. Nitin Gadkari said, you will have to go to EV and I'll bulldoze the industry to getting into it. Now, taking on from what is that? Raskutta is saying what Lavish is saying. It's state capacity and state needs to go in. State thought that there was a need for adaptation. But how much of a challenge does that create for the private sector? How much of sanctity does it leave for price signals? Because pricing essentially did not seem to be very environment, I mean, EV oriented. Uh, you face the brunt of it. So what's been your experience of that? 
Uh, first of all, I'll agree with Dr. Da in this context, I'll agree with Dr. Das Gupta. The state has to take leadership. You don't leadership. necessarily have to. Which is fine. Uh, I've worked with him in the past. <laughs> the state has to take leadership and define an outcome and then define a regulatory mechanism and then markets follow. And he made a statement, yes. Of course, in all these statements, even by Niti Aayog, there is an element of stretch in the ambition which everybody realizes. And even in, uh, you know, uh, closed room discussions, we acknowledge with each other that there is an element of stretch, but this is the direction to go. <clears throat> At that point of time, I'll also mention that there is, uh, there is a cost stretch. The cost of transitioning to much lower, uh, you mentioned 45%, incidentally, in the transport sector with some stretch, we should be able to, this is on a base of 2005. So 2005 to 2030, 45% uh, intensity, we should be able to, with some stretch, manage. Uh, and we are happy about it, that we can claim such a, such a target. But it does come at a cost. Sometimes the infrastructure, for example, charging infrastructure, is just not uh, sufficient to support it. That is where we continuously request the policy makers, kindly be flexible on the path to the end. Please do not define the means or the paths. Define the end, end goal, which is just CO2 or uh, the GHG, and allow us the R&D or the innovation to achieve that goal. And let all policy be incentivizing the end rather than the means to an end. And uh, I'll again, uh, she talked about the unique context of India and things need to be suited for India. C uh, compressed biogas, for example, it's a beautiful technology. It can get you carbon negative at times. So, and we are, the, as much as I'm working on cars, I'm also working on the fact that if we have to capture the animal wealth of India, if you scape through the cow dung from the, from the ground, some amount of soil comes in, and that soil spoils the, you know, my digesters in the biogas plants. So we are working on all such fronts, any such technology that India can, that can uniquely serve India given its unique context, and we adapt to the end measure, yes. Uh, but to uh, finally answer your question, there is a stretch, and it comes at a cost. Stretch and comes at a cost. Um, I'll just, uh, at this point, I mean, of course, Ravish, you've got a hard stop, but if you could take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, so, 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 uh, I have lots, but let me see. The audience has, is they are staying awake. So, yeah. Please identify yourself and uh, which panelist you want to speak to, if there's anyone to. Vanali, would you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, I just, it's a quick comment. Um, actually, I was recently asked to read Lavesh, Lavesh's, the, this thing that, um, I was recently asked to actually read Lavisha's uh, report on public sector enterprises. Um, and I, it was in the 1980s. It's a phenomenal report. Uh, so I read it actually last year. And uh, when I was reading it, I just actually thought, oh, there's nothing new to add. It's already been all been done. And the numbers, again, reanalyzing the numbers, there was actually nothing that was, could add to the report. Um, it's one of those gems that uh, it, it lies in our NCR walls. Um, but uh, one question that uh, in my recent, uh, in our recent work that I did on farm mechanization, I did find that, uh, it found similar results, that the public sector research, uh, into this thing on research is coming down, investment in research, whereas private sector investment in research is going up. And in that sector, there is a lot of investment in, um, relatively speaking, to other, other emerging countries. There was investment in, um, in uh, green technology, like green tractors and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, and, uh, and I'd want to bring on the debate, I um, want a question to Lavish that, uh, or, to, or to everybody in the panel, is uh, the, given the recent monetization debate that is happening, that we want to monetize our assets, uh, how will, uh, when you talk about public sector enterprises, what is the role uh, if you're going to monetize them, they're actually passing off to the private sector. So what is the, uh, how will you, 
leverage the public sector enterprises? Uh, how are the two related to each other? The two, that while we are on one hand trying to monetize assets, on the other hand, we want them to take a leading role in moving towards net zero. Okay, we should start off with Rahul also. By the way, we are talking about monetizing of assets, not of MLA, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very quickly, uh, uh, monetization is not obviously privatization because the control is still in public sector hands. Uh, and by public sector hands, the problem essentially is not anything to do with public sector, but the lines of control. Uh, the lines of control go through bureaucracy, which is changing very frequently. So if you are reporting to someone whose changes very frequently, objectives are changing, et cetera, et cetera, then of course you as a public sector manager will have some sort of a problem. So that is the biggest issue there. Uh, however, the theory says that the market even though only some part of the total ownership is with the market, the market will price in that. And that will send a signal to the public sector manager to behave. The problem, given that 20 years of whatever little bit of uh, monetization we've done, is that those signals haven't helped public sector managers perform better. So that's the issue. Well, this is... Um I just also, before I thought, uh, uh, before I asking Das Gupta, I thought I'll ask Dr. Aroda if uh, you would like to come in on the debate now. I mean, we have, throughout the afternoon, we have been, I mean, you've been uh, more in session. You didn't get a chance to put in your point. So, yeah. One second. Sorry, I just, one, one, one thing. Sorry, sure. intervening. On my right, I'm sitting a great example of, uh, of a privatization. Uh, that that has achieved great returns for the government so, so financial since, you, and since so you're spoke of, we were a public sector company even when we were public sector we were able to provide an exception and there's a book written on it i'll send you that book we later privatized when the market realities needed us to uh, do that so uh, and there is a whole lot of wisdom on how public sector can still uh, be vibrant and competitive yeah, that's an interesting point, and uh, we are delighted to have Dr. Suman Berry with us. And uh, uh, we were taking on the panel discussion on building state capacity uh, with respect to environment, and Lavish and Dr. Das Gupta and Rahul had some very interesting points to say. But Dr. Das Gupta, I mean, if you, uh, you wanted to, I mean, I thought you could come in here about uh, the fact that whether the public sector can actually be the leader in terms of developing state capacity for such a complicated thing like climate change? Oh, definitely. Definitely, I do, do think the public sector can be, I think. Um, you know, the public sector is, is uh, not a homogeneous body, <laughs> as we tend to think about it. It's, it's just one phrase, but actually, there are all kinds of institutions within this uh, broad uh, term, encapsulated within this broad term of the public sector. So definitely at national levels and subnational levels, right down to the panchayat level. I think if we have a lot of capacity already there, which can be lever leveraged very beautifully to address the transition. I, I have in no two minds about it. Yes. Possibly lots more skilling, lots more, um, broadly speaking, capacity building needs to take place to enable, you know, handling this thing that we haven't really thought of much in the past. <laughs> but um, I definitely see scope for it. And I think we've, the public sector's performed beautifully in many respects. And I think COVID taught us, all of us, about the importance of our public sector, yeah. broadly defined public sector. No two ways about that. Right. I don't want to get into the business of what I had some of the experience with my good friends in Coal India on environment mitigation, but. Uh, 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 I think you know, we are already late, so maybe we can start the session. Cool. Uh, so I leave my question. So thanks a lot to the panel for having been here, and it was, as usual, a delight. And thank you, Lavish, Dr. thank you, Dr. Dasgupta, and thank you, Rahul, for having been here and joined us. And uh, thank you to NCR and AIB 
for giving us this opportunity. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to the panelists who have uh, discussed this pertinent issue in a very exciting manner. I would uh, request now uh, Mr. Sumen Berry to deliver the keynote address uh, and Dr. Barnali Bhandari to chair the session. And welcome uh, everyone. Uh, that was a very invigorating uh, panel discussion. I did learn something of today. Um, it's my privilege and my honor to invite Mr. Berry, who needs no introduction. He is currently the Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog in the rank and status of a Cabinet Minister, an experienced policy economist and research administrator. He has been a senior visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research, New Delhi, a global fellow in the Asia program of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., and a non-resident fellow at Bruegel, an economic policy research institution in Brussels. From early 2012 till 2016, Mr. Berry was Royal Dutch Global Chief Economist based in The Hague. And before his um, appointment at Shell, he served as Director General at our very own institution, NCER. Uh, he had earlier served as a minister, uh, member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council of India Statistical Commission and of the Reserve Bank of India Technical Advisory Committee on Monetary Policy. And my most important introduction is that he was my first boss in NCER and he hired me into NCER. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks, <laughs> Bernali. Uh, look, I'm going to sit here because somehow keynote uh, address sounds... Um, you know, very pompous and stiff and prepared, and uh, this is going to be none of those. Um, let me first, um, you know, thank NCAR and AIIB uh, for uh, giving me this platform and this opportunity. Let me also talk of another association uh, uh, with NCAR, which is that in many ways, um, you know, Eric was very important in the, uh, Eric Bergloff from AIIB, uh, who is, is here and who must have been introduced to you and is a, a good friend, uh, you know, he brought in some ways global engagement to NCAR when uh, he worked uh, uh, jointly with Strobe Talbot at uh, the Brookings Institution to uh, explore the concept of something I think that was called the Global Institute or something like that, Eric? Yeah. And so uh, Eric uh, was instrumental, or the Global Institute was uh, a, a kind of de facto sponsor of engagement supported by BP uh, with uh, think tanks in both China and Russia pretty early on. And um, Rajesh Chadda, um, who, who was at NCR at that time, uh, took forward those relationships even after I left. Um, and so uh, not only is it a pleasure to be at an NCR institute, see many uh, in, uh, event and see many um, friends, but also uh, an opportunity to acknowledge Eric's indirect but longstanding relationship uh, with um, NCAR. Um, so I did have the opportunity to participate in the Beijing launch of this, uh, but uh, time moves on. And we are here for the, uh, the regional launch or the India launch, uh, um, which coincides with the start of India's G20 presidency. Uh, I assume that you will have had enough, uh, as it were, uh, discussion and guidance on, as it were, the, the main content of the report, uh, which is, of course, captured in its... Um, title, Transforming State Capacity and Mobilizing the Private Sector to a net, net Zero and the whole concept of a moonshot. Um, what, uh, you know, what I would, you know, wish to do is to, and Eric would have heard some of this when he was here in July at the Cotillia Economic Conclave, for which I apologize, but I would, you know, in a sense like to to use the musical term, riff a little bit on wider issues associated with, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the, the transition to net zero. 
But let me start by acknowledging the India chapter in the report, uh, which is a very valuable and thorough compilation of a lot of data from a lot of places. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, very pleased and proud that the AIIB, we, uh, you know, continues to be a, a forum that brings together thinking and uh, uh, engagement between uh, India and China on issues of common uh, interest. And also, uh, I understand that the president was recently in Delhi and interacted uh, with, uh, with the finance minister. And so uh, the fact that the report, as it were, has, deals with some generic themes, but then does a deep dive uh, in, um, as it were, two very important players in, uh, um, in the global energy transition. Uh, is something that I applaud and welcome. What I'm going to talk about uh, are essentially, or, or contribute to the discussion, I don't know, I hope there's time for Q&A, is basically to um, um, just reflect on four issues. One is, uh, as it were, the macroeconomics of the transition. Uh, I th which has started to get some attention, I think, uh, through the work of my former colleague Jean uh, Pisani-Ferry at Bruegel and, and others, but I th don't think is being adequately thought about uh, in a nation context. Uh, the second is uh, the issue of uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, and those of you who have started to follow some of the publicly available information on India's G20 presidency will know that for reasons that I'm happy to get into, that uh, much of them, much of the underlying architecture is about the sustainable development goals and the SDGs are important to NITI because NITI is the so-called nodal agency for the SDGs. And uh, the third topic, uh, would be, as it were, the uh, uh, the mitigation, uh, the adaptation challenge, as much as the mitigation challenge. Uh, the fourth would be, as it were, climate finance, which is relevant because, after all, AIIB is, uh, you know, at heart a financial institution which has committed itself to, as it were. Um, the, the climate, the decarbonization, and I assume the adaptation and agenda as well. And then finally, uh, state capacity and states, uh, both of which are issues of uh, significance uh, to, um, to Niti. So what, what is the total time I'm allotted? 20 minutes, is it? Yeah. Is there time for Q&A at yeah. the end? Okay, so please hold me uh, to... to you know, 12 or 15 minutes, uh, uh, although I'm quite willing to be unceremoniously dismissed by Anil as the previous panel was, uh, uh, if, I'm <laughs> if I exceed, uh, exceed my time, and I also have people waiting for me at Niti. Okay, so um, let me just talk uh, first about uh, the macro challenge, and this is what I talked about at Cotillia. I think, um, you know, this report, but increasingly other work surrounding COP27, including an important report on climate finance by uh, Amar Bhattacharya, my former colleague at the World Bank and Nick Stern, you know, is be beginning to redefine the climate challenge as a, uh, an accelerated investment challenge, that the whole nature of, as it were, the green transition is uh, essentially high capex, low opex, uh, and I'm talking about fresh investments. I'm not talking about stranded assets and uh, all of that. Um, and so uh, the, the question becomes, uh, and there are some absolutely humongous numbers in the uh, AIIB report, uh, you know, as uh, Carl Sagan used to say, trillions and trillions of stars, so trillions and trillions of dollars. Um, but, 
you know, the fact of the matter is that uh, the developing world, and I'll speak of India, but the, the issue is generalizable, is coming into the energy transition after a lot of turbulence. Firstly, turbulence connected with COVID. Secondly, turbulence connected now with the war in Ukraine. And most importantly, the buildup of a lot of debt, external debt and domestic debt, which was justified given the nature of, of the challenge. And I think, you know, in some ways, while there has been a massive death toll, it could have been a lot worse. Uh, so those are the starting conditions, which is that fiscal capacity is attenuated, debt levels are high, and yet the if we accept and believe, as I think we have to, as uh, the, the notion that uh, the window is quite limited, emerging markets, uh, well, everybody, all major emitters, including India, are being asked to, as it were, step up uh, their... Uh, investment rates by, let's say, one or two percent of GDP. The most specific calculations that I know of have been done by uh, my good friend Homi Haras at Brookings, where he looks at the fiscal space that's available, looks at de debt sustainability, um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, essentially shapes the issue of how much incremental investment as a share of GDP is going to be needed, how much of that displaces investment that otherwise would have taken place, say, in the fossil industries and thermal plants, etc., cetera, um, and then how much uh, needs to be truly incremental. And so just looking at it in terms of the savings investment balance, unless dramatic things happen to saving, if you want to up the investment rate by one or two percentage points of GDP for quite some time, and uh, Hobie's paper provides the calculation for that, uh, well, uh, you know, that's, that is going to have to be financed from somewhere else. So that is, as it were, the financing challenge associated with which is a cost of capital challenge, which is also in part uh, under the Indian G20 presidency, why people are beginning to look with greedy eyes at the multilateral development banks. But the point I want to make, for those of you who are development economists, is that in the literature, there is something called the transfer problem, which, you, which is that an economy cannot actually absorb additional uh, foreign resources without widening its current account deficit. And so, therefore, the question of whether, and this is the point I raised at Cotillia, whether the world has a financial system which is fit for purpose so that countries like India, you know, and they, their performance can be monitored, uh, are, um, you know, able safely to increase, uh, as it were, the, the, uh, the speed limit or the, 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 uh, uh, the level uh, of, of a safe current account deficit from 2% of GDP to 3, 3.5% of GDP. And I would remind you that Turkey and is running a much higher uh, current account deficit. So, as it were, the question of... Uh, ensuring through all kinds of machinery that, as it were, a, a country like India feels comfortable in running a current account deficit of 3.5% of GDP rather than just 2% of GDP is, uh, is the mac a macro challenge. There are others uh, as well. And this is particularly problematic if you already have elevated public debt levels. Okay. Now, this is essentially a public finance issue. Much of what we are going to talk about is uh, private finance, and I'll come to that. But I just want to say, at the macro level, what you're talking about is a step up in the investment rate, uh, which, if, if financed from abroad, will require your current account deficit to rise. And there may even be Dutch disease kinds of issues that you need to think about. Uh, I see Sanjeev uh, nodding, and he... he 
uh, has the modeling framework uh, to, to um, as it were, explore this. Okay. Now, the second issue then is, uh, you know, the balance between uh, mitigation and adaptation. Uh, many of you read The Economist, and The Economist is already, you know, saying that 1.5 degrees uh, is beyond reach. Uh, I don't, I mean, Government of India doesn't take a view on that, and I'm, not, I'm speaking here as a representative of Government of India. Uh, but I think it's reasonably clear that the incremental, you know, um, resources uh, both, as it were, uh, recurrent expenditures as well as capital expenditures are going to be um, associated not just with mitigation but with adaptation as well. Uh, since I was, uh, as was uh, mentioned by Bornali, uh, in The Hague for, uh, uh, for four years, which is just down the road from uh, Rotterdam, I mean, it, you have to you know, to see, to believe the scale of the investment that the Dutch are putting in to protect themselves from rising sea levels, etc. We don't have those means and resources, but, you know, that is what I mean by an investment program that's uh, focused on adaptation. Forget mitigation and the green transition and all of that. The focus of the report is net zero, which is mitigation, I'm just saying that the, uh, if you like, the developmental challenge uh, uh, comprehends adaptation as well. And that has public finance implications which go over and above, or, or which are not go over and above, but which are nested in, as it were, the investment challenge that I talked about uh, to, to begin with. So the second point, uh, the, my second riff on the uh, uh, on, on the theme of the report is let's not forget adaptation because that's going to be as much of a demand on public finances and on investment as, uh, I, I don't know, I don't have the numbers, uh, we're working on them, uh, I'm sure they exist, but uh, what the split is between mitigation and adaptation incremental investment is an important parameter uh, as we think of uh, both the macro and uh, uh, and the public finances. Um, let me then talk about, as I had indicated, um, why the um, sustainable development goals are important uh, and, you know, relate them to some extent to uh, both net zero but also to the G20. Um, Again, this is on the record, a public forum, so I won't name names, but let me just say that there was, I mean, as I see the evolution, uh, it's really in three parts. In 2015, about the time that the Honorable Prime Minister, uh, soon after he was elected, um, the UN, after a lot of internal debate and discussion, uh, succeeded in having a universal acceptance of the Sustainable Development Goals. And when you consider how a scant seven years later, how split and divided and polarized the global, econ the global, the global society uh, has become, I think it's, that's a precious achievement and we must hold on to it. It was one expression by the global community of what they saw as collective aspirations for the planet. And I think it's very important to recall that while sustainability was a core element of it, it was sustainability embedded in a development vision and an inclusive development vision. And let me also say that since uh, the G20 keeps stating that its core mission is economic cooperation for s strong, robust, sustainable, and inclusive growth. There is a, a clear, uh, as it were, convergence between the professed goals of the G20 and the, and the professed uh, 
uh, and the architecture, let me put it that way, of the SDGs. But that said, uh, as the Secretary General, who was here recently, uh, you know, uh, said in, uh, has said in no uncertain terms, he said that in Sharm el Sheikh, he said that also uh, at the General Assembly. I had the privilege of meeting him when he visited here in Gujarat. Uh, you know, uh, professions are one thing, but one cannot actually say that the outcome particularly post-COVID, of the G20's labors have resulted in the outcome of strong, uh, of strong sus um, uh, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth, uh, as reflected in the retrogression of the uh, SDGs. The important point I want to make is that, uh, particularly uh, at the time of um, COP26 and the Italian presidency of the G20, almost all the focus started to become on coal and mitigation, okay? That you were a bad boy if you, uh, you know, did not go to net zero faster than 2070, and you were a bad boy if you insisted on the phase down rather than the phase out of coal. I think the mood has changed. I think the mood has changed in part of, as it were, the rather uh, sharp shock that uh, that uh, uh, parts of the world uh, have uh, encountered in, on the issue of energy security. So be that as it may, I just want to say that India has in good faith committed to 2070, but the SDGs give us the global uh, permission, if you like, to embed uh, as it were, our mitigation uh, transition uh, within an overall framework of development, and that is the framework that underlies uh, India's uh, um, G20 um, presidency. My final two remarks, and um, you've not scolded me yet, but I'm, I'm sure I've exceeded my time, uh, is, uh, is uh, basically uh, state capacity and and the subnational level um, states. I think what is remarkable, uh, whether it will spill over to this domain remains to be seen, and many people are working on this. But what I think Indians in this room and those who are friends of India, like the AIIB, would uh, acknowledge is that through the use of technology, but also through leadership, uh, India has been able to achieve transformation at scale. Uh, essentially, I would say the start was Aadhaar, which was, of course, under the UPA, but building on Aadhaar and the so-called India stack, uh, I think we have... Uh, made huge strides on, uh, as it were, last mile delivery and implementation. Now, uh, there's a long way to go, and state capacity means lots of things, different things to different people, but some of you may know the work of Land Pritchett, where, who described India as a flailing state. I don't, I've asked Land whether he would still use that description of India today. So, uh, you know, I, th I know that part of what's involved in, uh, uh, in the discussion of state capability and state capacity is what was being discussed towards the end of the last panel, which I missed, uh, I would have liked to have been here for, which is state-owned enterprises. But I think uh, the, the, the deeper question the deeper questions to my mind are two. Um, one is, uh, so India's, uh, if you like, terminology for a moonshot is mission mode. And so the question of, you know, whether we need to do even more in mission mode, after all, decarbonization has been in mission mode um, 
going back to Dr. Manmohan Singh, but really, uh, you know, what what is the balance between mission mode and state capability and policies, particularly if a large part of what is to be achieved has to be in the private sector? My own rather half-formed thought on this is that if there is an area where uh, India as a state needs to progress, it is to, as it were, develop its regulatory culture uh, uh, more successfully than it's been able to do. Eric is here. I don't know if he'll enter into the conversation. I'd welcome it if he did. Uh, but again, talking of Homi Kharas, uh, who was one of the originators of the concept of the middle income trap, we're not, you know, uh, we, uh, we're not quite there yet, but China is. And so, you know, I would have thought that, as it were, shifting from a command and control uh, uh, or even mission mode to a regulatory mode might be, as it were, an important transition uh, in state uh, capability. And then finally, uh, it is very helpful that the AIIB report gives us the profile of what individual states are doing in, for example, PPP mode, uh, and the fact that, indeed, state attractiveness, administrative capability is very diverse across India. Niti is setting up, at the moment, so-called state support missions, which are on offer to assist individual states for thinking about their transition, their trajectory to 2047, uh, which is uh, the uh, injunction from the Honorable Prime Minister. But uh, in all of this, at the state level, and indeed, as was being discussed in the last panel, at the, uh, at the district level even, thinking concretely about, as it were, the enormous challenges and opportunities thrown up by uh, the commitment to net zero uh, is, I think, going to be a very large part of our engagement with them. So with that, let me thank NCAR, let me thank the AIIB, not only for their work, but also for reaching out to me to speak to a local audience. And over to you, Barnali. Uh, uh, any questions? Uh, Dr. Pohit. <laughs> Thank you. My question is regarding, I think, probably the more challenge in India is subnational level. My macronomic challenge is national is okay, but problem is that whatever the transition has to be taken place, is it a regular state? They are coal or this, this kind of dirty fuel are the main source of revenue. And the investment will be coming to the developed state, where there, will, there is no revenue problem. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, I'll take one at a time. I mean, look, uh, Lavish was here, and Lavish for CSEP has done a study on, as it were, the fiscal dimensions. Okay. Uh, and it's not just at the state level. I mean, the dependence uh, of the union government also on fossil taxation is pretty damn high. Okay, So I, I accept that there may be more capacity you know, by the same token, let's see where we are. Um, I have worked on Latin America in the past, and I can say that politically, Brazil has, has struggled and continues to struggle to move from an origin-based to a destination-based uh, value-added tax system, uh, which is very disruptive and involves, you know, lots of, as it were, uh, side payments and transfers. Uh, it took, it was rough going from 2017 to 2022, but now, and you know, and of course, some of the comparisons are against the COVID period, but people indicate that 
you know, the GSTN is now working and that uh, uh, even without, uh, of course, the states will always say, we, you know, we are hard, hard done by. So, I mean, I would say that what this means for fiscal federalism is every bit as challenging as what GST represented. Now, uh, the 15th Finance Commission did, you know, think quite hard about certain other national challenges, particularly health, because it was, you know, more or less required to by the fact that it was working during the pandemic. Uh, as the terms of reference of the 16th Finance Commission start to be prepared, and uh, I imagine, or I'm not sure, that Neeti might be asked to uh, contribute to those. I mean, I think that would be an opportunity for us to say that states can't do this on their own, okay? Um, and so, as it were, uh, but it has to be incentive compatible as well. And so, I think you're right. I think coming up with a design of a, a federal fiscal architecture which embeds the climate transition in it and takes account of, as it were, different starting points, and not just, uh, as it were, uh, royalties and revenues, but also employment. And this is not only a question of, uh, as it were, the uh, fuels themselves. It's also a question of transportation, railways, all of this. So, uh, uh, you know, I think the message has gone out to all line ministries that the time is now, okay? And, well, you know that already, at least in terms of uh, mitigation, and again, this comes back to a theme of the report, uh, which is the public sector, railways have, as it were, uh, come, gone quite far in abandoning diesel, moving to electricity, trying to, as it were, provide assured customers for green electricity, etc. Again, this is less the public sector than the private sector, but uh, you know the green hydrogen hydrogen mission. Uh, uh, this is not addressing the subnational issue. I'm, I'm talking really at the national level. So let me so that in case there are other questions, I don't speak too long. I would just say that uh, uh, this is a major dimension of uh, how fiscal federalism will need to evolve, and I'm sure. Neeti, as the spokesperson for the states uh, at the center, will be actively involved. Any more questions? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on moving from mission mode to regulatory mode, like what kind of regulatory changes are you foreseeing? So possibly GST, et cetera, is part of that. But what further regulatory changes uh, would you like? Thank you. Well, um, this goes to uh, the private to private dimension of the energy transition. Look, we've already come a pretty long way uh, in electricity. Um, generation when those of you who were at NCR with me at the beginning of the journey, uh, you know, uh, we had somebody by the name of Gajendra Haldia uh, who was uh, in NCR uh, who worked on the first energy bill which then became the Energy Act of 2003. Um, so uh, at that time, uh, the uh, challenge was to create a regulatory framework that would open up thermal generation away from central and state PSUs, the NTPCs of the world and uh, the, their state equivalents, to the private sector. And there was a lot of hard work that went into model contract agreements, and uh, and there were a lot of hiccups along the way. Some of you may know the story of the you know the deal that uh, 
that India struck with, the, uh, with GE at the ball. Uh, however, I think the record shows that by that within a decade, a large part of the new fleet of both gas and electric thermal plants uh, were, were so-called merchant plants, that they had been put up by the private sector. And that then raised the next set of issues, which had to do with security of payment, the status of uh, the financial status of the DISCOMs, etc. At that point, uh, new generating capacity was almost entirely, oh, sorry, uh, at that point, new generating capacity was only at the margins coming from the private sector, and yet in the, uh, uh, in the renewables transition, I think I'm right in saying it's only now that the entities of the world are entering into it, that really much of the capacity up till now has been, uh, as it were, spearheaded by private investors, the Renews and, uh, you know, um, Green Co's and things like that. Now, that is only possible if there is a regulatory frame. So, what I'm saying is mission mode is good for getting the public sector to do things. Stable regulation is what you need. Uh, and, as it were, jurisprudence associated with stable regulation if you want large sums of money to come into investments that are going to be made uh, by the private sector. And I would say that, you know, our performance, for example, in oil and gas has been somewhat mixed because there hasn't been the regulatory certainty. And I don't mind saying, even though I'm now working in government, that some of the caution that a firm like Shell had in as it were, committing itself to exploration in India, was uncertainty about regulatory stability. I don't know if that makes the point clear, but that's, those are the sets of issues that I had in mind. Am I standing between people in high tea, including myself? Or, uh, uh -huh. uh, but I'm happy to take others, but I do need to get back because there's uh, uh, a new Rajasabha MP who wishes to come and see me. But. I think somebody behind you as well. Was, did you also? No, okay, yeah. So, uh, thank you. I think you know, the question that I have is um, as you know, we uh, have uh, Mr. Uday Bir Das as our visiting senior fellow, and I was having a discussion with him. And I think you know, the point of discussion was that uh, there are you know, a lot of numbers being thrown up in terms of the estimates of costs uh, for each country, for, 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 for the world as a whole. Um, so uh, uh, who do we really believe? Um, I think, the, the, you, you, as you rightly mentioned, of course, you know, there is this bifurcation between adaptation and mitigation. But is there, you know, a firm estimate I can understand that it is hard because, you know, technology is evolving and I think, you know, the changes that are really likely to take place, it's hard to really pinpoint, but are there any firm estimates that one can really believe and how uh, much this is going okay, to Okay, just to bring the uh, discussion to a close, um, if there are estimates, uh, you should immediately distrust them. Okay, um, so um, no, I mean they are meant to. Uh, I, I say this as somebody who's a vet, not a veteran, but a, a product of the shell scenario traditions. Because you know what is the essence of the shell scenarios is that the only sure fact about a forecast is that it's going to be wrong. Okay, so but you do need, as it were, um, you know, you do need some dimensioning. Uh, but if any of you have read the Bill Gates book uh, on the climate crisis, uh, the real moonshot is in technology, A. So two, three uh, concluding points. One, the shell doctrine on this, uh, which is slightly contrary to what I said originally, is that uh, 
probably the technologies that are going, that energy is so vast that most of the technologies that will go to scale, we already know. So therefore, uh, you know, there's not going to be anything very dramatic that's going to move the needle, okay? But the, way, the rate at which the, you go down the cost curves on those technologies is the big unknown, okay? And that's the bet that India is now making on green hydrogen, which is that, uh, and we are where we are on um, thin film solar, um, uh, or on um, uh, essentially because Germany in particular invested 100 billion euro, as it were, through feed-in tariffs and all kinds of things to bring as it were, the experience and the cost curves down. It's another matter then that China, as it were, uh, entered at scale. And so now, uh, as it were, the, uh, uh, the solar panel industry is largely located in, India, in uh, China. So um, uh, to me, it's not a question of breakthrough technologies, but to use the phrase, uh, shell phrase, not breakthrough technologies, but technologies breaking through. The final point is, I'm old enough to remember when, uh, you know, atomic fission uh, was, or the new, uh, uh, civ uh, civil nuclear uh, energy was first uh, embraced by the world in the early 50s. And, you know, there was this vision of cheap, abundant energy. And these things never quite work out in the way that you think they are going to. And therefore, you know, as somebody now who's, as, uh, in effect, a planner for government, I would say, for God's sake, don't end up in a corner solution. Hedge your bets, follow lots of technologies, but let the basic research be done by the big boys because they can afford it, we can't. With that, Bornelli, over to you. Thank you, uh, sir. As usual, it's always a pleasure and learning process to listen to you. Of course, I've been lucky enough in the first two years. Um, without further ado, uh, my colleague, uh, Swami Amato, will give the vote of thanks and thank you for a very... Uh, I could see how you were thinking um, through the process uh, of a very complicated talk and dividing it into simple pieces for the audience to understand. Thank you so much, Ms. Yeah. Barrett. Samia, it's yours. It was an invigorating uh, discussion on building uh, mission-driven institution, uh, state institutional capacities and uh, creating right conditions for private sector for their capital, scale, energy, and dynam dynamism. Um, it, is now, it is my honor and privilege to give a vote of thanks to our distinguished panelist and Mr. Sumanderi and my colleague, Dr. Bernali, for, who took time off from their uh, respective busy schedules and enlightened us with on this uh, imperative subject with far-reaching ramifications. I would also like to express um, our deep gratitude to, uh, to the DG of NCAR, Dr. Su uh, Dr. Poonam Gupta, for her consistent support. I would also like to express my thanks to AIIB team, especially Dr. Bergloff, and uh, Dr. Uh, Abhijit Sen Gupta for partnering with uh, NCAR um, to launch the report. No event is successful with the team who works behind the scenes. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues at NCAR for their efforts in organizing this event. Uh, Dr. Anil Sharma, Mr. Piyush Gupta, Mr. Girish Khulbe, Mr. Praveen Sajdeva, Ms. Poonam Dhawan, Ms. Sadna Singh, Ms. Khushminder Kaur, Ms. Sudesh Bala, and Mr. Prem Prakash Joshi. Last but not the least, I would like to thank you all for being a very patient and uh, participative audience. Thank you.
Uh, we have the Haiti in the next room. Please join us for Haiti.